Hey everybody, I'm Todd Anderson. And I'm Ross Miriam. And you're watching the Versus series by StarCityGames.com. So today on the Versus series, we're going to be wrapping up our walk through the Hall of Champions where Ross and I dug deep and found our favorite five finals matches in the last 10, pro, 10 years of Pro Tour history. And this might be the single best match at the time that was played. It was absolutely incredible. Two of the maybe five to seven-ish best players of all time. Uh, Luis Scott Vargas was playing the deck I'm uh, piloting today, and Gabriel Nassif was on... Uh, playing the deck that Todd is playing. LSV was going for a back-to-back -back Pro Tour wins. He had won with Elves in Berlin yep. that fall. And so th this was sort of the emergence of him as an elite player. Mm -hmm. um, and it, Gabriel Nassif had to play the match of his life to take him down, and he did. Yeah, uh, th this matchup, I actually watched this live. Uh, I was like 20 years old or so. Would you have negated the Ajani in Game 4? Actually, wait, what year is this? 2007? This 2000, was 2009. 2009? Tour of 09. Uh, I, was, I was like 23 years old. I'd played on one Pro Tour at this point, and I was really trying to, trying hard to, to grind my way back onto the Pro Tour scene. Uh, I was, tr you know, traversing landscapes, flying all around the country, uh, driving. Traversing those oven walls. You know, trying to find Pro Tour qualifiers and Grand Prix, and, and uh, the, the play of these players really inspired me. You know, just watching this match, aside from the, the final game where Luis ended up mulling to five, I think maybe, or maybe it was even four, uh, just both players, I thought, just haymaker after haymaker, comebacks, uh, top decks. Like, there was a point where Gabriel Nassif, like, had no cards in hand, separated his mana in such a way that uh, he, he got his cruel tomato mana set up. This is actually in the top eight that he did that. Oh, okay. Uh, but he was, like, setting up his cruel tomato mana and just, like, peeled it and put it on the table and then turned his lands sideways real yeah, fast. the call shot cruel tomato. That was in the quarterfinals against Matteo Rossini Jones. Uh, I and that... remember this stuff. Just, <laughs> just steel a pile of useless Ste information. Yeah, steel trap, Todd. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. But that... Anywho, but that that was a, a really fun top eight to watch. It was also the one where, uh, I believe, Cedric Phillips made yes, top eight. playing his Kithkins. Yeah, as he was known for for many years after that. Yeah, and I mean, he eventually branched out and started playing fairies. He's like, I, you know, I'm sick of trying to play on Cryptic Command. I'm just going to play Cryptic Commands my own. And that was, you know, right before the the real dominance of fairies kicked off uh, a couple months later. Yeah, and uh, no, this was wasn't this after fairies was really dominant. Mm -hmm. I don't so remember. This was after Ancestral Rotated. It's, this I'm, was when Fairies wasn't as good. This was like the year that Tokens sure. dominated. This was all Spectrum Procession for that winter. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, uh, this top eight was really sweet. It was a bunch of diverse decks. Uh, five Color Control was really starting to, to get its roots, and people were uh, showcasing exactly what you could do with uh, Vivid Lands, Reflecting Pool. Pool. It, Reflecting Pool was like a $30 card. Yeah, it was crazy. I've never seen... And I don't think there ever will be again a repeat of a mana base that's capable of what this mana base did. People were just playing literally any card they wanted. But Cloud Thresher, Cruel Tomatoes, same deck, easy game. Yeah. Green, 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 blue, blue, black, 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 red, red, in. Yeah. Could probably throw in some white cards in that deck too. Oh, it has just white any, cards. Yeah, absolutely. Any card, blue, feel, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, that's three blue too. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Just put, a, put them all in the deck. Any card you want. Just, <laughs> there was no search by my deck's colors. It was just any card in the format. Just put it in. You can cast it. doesn't matter. Yeah, it was it was really sweet. Uh, I mean, obviously it was it was a bit degenerate. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, might explain Arcane Sanctum just as a tap to black white dual land. <laughs> Come on. Well, that's I mean you know it's not my fault. I know. You know this is just <laughs> these these vivid lands were unreal. They were pretty egregious, and the fact that even when they had no counters on them, could still turn on Reflecting Pool to me was like kind of a weird thing. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, it it didn't come up that often. Um. But I don't know. The mana base was definitely the the talk of of the the reason why this five color deck was fairly infamous at the time. I know that uh, for the nationals that year, I actually that was my first breakout tournament. I was playing this five color deck with you know obviously it had uh, changed over time. Sure. First, second, third was uh, me, Charles Gindy, and um... oh man, I can't. TCG, he writes for TCG player uh, Adam maybe your no. chick your chick yeah duh 
I, I've known Yurchek for so long, I cannot believe I blanked on him. Okay. Me, me, Yurchek... Fairies Yurchek, must have been around that winter then, because Fairies, fairies was good at that, fairies that was spring good pro at, tour. Fairies, okay, so Fairies got ninth at this pro tour. We're delving too deep. I just want, yeah. I was trying to say that the first, second, third of that tournament was all this five-color control deck at Nationals that year. Just want to yeah. point that out. Uh, I had to play uh, a Brad Nelson in the top four playoff uh, for the national team, and he was playing this, like, also five color deck, but it was a Blood Braid Elf, uh, Bituminous Blast, Weirdo yeah. Jun deck. So probably know. like four Cryptic Commands and two Flyer Threshers in it. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Anywho, probably uh, this, a Sarah Avatar. This somewhere. matchup is awesome. Uh, we're gonna play all three games no matter what happens. So far, we've been doing that. It's been a two zero into uh, either a three zero or a two one. So at least we're getting some sweet games in game three. Usually. Yeah, we've had a lot of good a lot of good games here. This is gonna be a back and forth matchup, so we should just get to it. It's gonna yeah, be long. It's gonna be too. long too. All right, yeah. let's go and get to the match. You take down between Gabriel Nassis, five color control, and Luis Scott Varius's black white tokens. Hyrule Sea goes first. Let's do it. I'm three out of five so far. Let's see if I can make it four out of five. Oh, we tied. Oh, rat. Now you're going to roll. Ooh. My dice rolling could do some work. Ooh. What Ooh. in the world? These dice are rigged. Okay, now i got to re-roll these. Ugh. Zero above average rolls. All right, oh, I no. Eight. I win. Hooray. Well, we got lands and spells. That's a good start. I do have lands and spells. Okay. Well, we're going to get some dice out for every single <laughs> land I put on the battlefield. Yeah, this is a good design. <laughs> yes. Hey, thanks for playing the Arcane Sanctum, so my Exotic Orchard taps for three colors instead of two. <laughs> yeah, everybody said one Exotic Orchard. Oh, this deck has like two. Pretty sure. Um, I'm going to play a Knight of Meadow Green. Uh, I don't think I have a ton of targets for it, so I'm just going to go ahead and blast it. Okay. I'll tap my Vivid Marsh for black. Oh, that was a good one. Your turn. Uh, I was hoping Todd would have a tap land here so I could sneak this through Broken Ambitions, but now I'm not going to be able to do that. So, Bitter Blossom. There's all. <sighs> Go. Well, I could still Broken Ambition it for one. Mm. Oh, yeah, but yeah. You, you want to play it. I, I, had, okay. I had an untapped land. Yeah, uh, what's it say? Destroy Target Enchantment? Gonna, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and destroy Target Enchantment. I'm going to tap this for white and then blue-black. Your turn. Okay, then. Usually you want to draw two cards with Esper Charm. That's the best mode on it. But against a card like Bitter Blossom where we don't have a ton of answers. Johnny Goldman. I'm going to counter draw. That's pretty good. Yeah. Go. Well. Okay. Fortunately, we did not have a, a really great follow-up after the Cryptic, so all of his big spells are going to be Let's make some Kithkins. Tough. All right. Kithkin soldiers. I was going to say, this had gone... Oh, this is an end of turn. I thought this was a beginning of turn. Sorry. Oh, I, should, yeah. I, I gained you one. You gained one. Sorry. 21. Yeah, I forgot that's an end of turn trigger. That's weird. But... All right. I'll play my big bomb baddie. Where's my Patrick Sullivan dragon? In a turn, I'll gain four up to 25. Wall of Reverence was a card that just decimated aggressive decks, but over time it actually just stopped showing up in the, the five-color control decks, at least in the main deck. Like, we played maybe one sometimes. Uh, cards like Plumeville were our anti-aggro stuff early. I ended up playing Fire Spout in one tournament. The original Broodmate's black, so I can't tear that one, but we can deal with the others, and then I'll attack with Cloud Goat. Yeah, I'll just take it. So okay. you're going to pump it up to five? Yeah, definitely going to pump it to five. 20 to 20? Yep. All right. You can tap any three Kithkin to pump Cloud Goat Ranger. Unfortunately for Ross, I do not have Cruel Tomatum. Or unfortunately for me. For yeah, you. fortunately for me. I'm 16, at 16 to 20. Your yep. Turn. Now I can freely attack with all of my creatures for six, I think. Oh, no, I could get Plume Veiled. That is a... Th Ooh. Ruh-ro, Raggy. Um... Whenever Ross goes, ooh, glorious anthem. It's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Uh, attack for f four. All right. I'll try to trade. Sure. I will take a point to 15 and play a Spectral Procession. That's pretty good. So you're at 15. Yeah. I'm going to okay. go ahead and use my mana in case I draw a Cruel Tomatum, and I'm just going to go ahead and play another Plume Veil. Another Plume Veil. So these spirits will trade off for the Broodmate Dragon, but the Plume Veil will uh, 
continue to be a nuisance. I think I'm just not going to attack for a while, right? Cause oh, yeah. I'm not going to trade. There's Bruno. no point in you attacking. All right, so. I'm just going to keep playing my lands in case I draw some draw twos. And you see how far this game would have spiraled out of control if that Bitter Blossom had stuck around, right? So, yeah. like, it's possible I... Ooh, uh, that's an interesting one. Windbris Kites. Yeah. I, mean, I got to hide away. This is part of a cycle back in the day. Got to hide away under the top... One of the top four. And if you meet whatever criteria... Yeah, which is, for this one, is attacking with three or more creatures. Which is very easy to do with cards like Spectral Procession and um, Thunder Ranger in your deck. Yeah, unfortunately, my attack right now is not particularly good. Um, that in order to turn this on, I'd basically have to throw away two to Kithkin. Mm. So, what is worth doing that? Is it this one or this one? It's hard for, hard to say, I think, but I kind of want to go with this just because we have more sort of that kind of effect. So, rest on the bottom. Oh, I assume you weren't attacking. I'm sorry. No, no, not attack. All right. Well, we drew a good one. Uh, Mold Drifter is going to allow us to draw some cards. I don't. I guess reflecting pool should always stay untapped. Yeah. Uh, this is an Esper land. Right, draw two. Yep. Another vivid land. Your turn. All right. I I will put a counter on them if I decide to actually. And at this point, I don't think I really even need to. Uh, Knight of Meadow Green. Yep. Pass the turn. Yeah, so now that lets me know that the card under Wimber's Kites is not worth trading in a couple of creatures here, so that's good news. This is not a great spot for me here. Eventually, Todd finds Cruel Ultimatum, and things sort of spiral. Yeah, I mean, I get back Wall of Reverence and start gaining four life a turn. I draw three cards, make him... I mean, he only had to sacrifice a token, but... Uh, I think I have to make some sort of move here. So, let's mush with these. All right, so if the Wimbrus Kites is another Anthem, that mean I, like, I don't want to gamble blocking the Knight of Meadow Grain, really. Uh, at least this turn, like, I can take a hit from it, and the next turn I'll have more information. So, uh, maybe only two should block here. The Moldrifter body is not that relevant, though. Like, if, if it's invalidated already. So, and he didn't attack with these, which means that he probably doesn't have an anthem under there. If he had an anthem, I think he would attack with these as well. So, what could it be? All right. Uh, I changed my mind. I'm going to do here and then block two Kithkins. Okay. It's an anthem. Why didn't you attack with these then? Because I didn't want you to think it was an anthem. Smart. Right, so, this gets first strike. <laughs> yeah. That this gets dies. first strike down. Lose one creature. And you wow. take three. Yeah. You're at 17. I'm at 19. Yeah, that was a good play from Ross. You can go. I really wish I had had a cryptic or broken ambition or something there to to really punish him for that. Uh, go. Now I'm just going to try to end the game before. Yeah, I'll block a spear, and I'm pretty sure I'm dust. That's, that's yeah. That's I, I literally do six lands in a row, and excluding the mole drifter, maybe more. Uh, we're here for sideboarding. Uh, I'm doing a quick little swap here. Uh, Wall of Reverence is not really for this matchup. Sure, the, the life padding is, is good every now and then, but honestly, uh, I'm going to win or lose by a mile in this matchup, I think. like The games are going to be super close, uh, but I'm going to be like at a relatively high life total, and we're kind of jockeying for, for position. Um, Wall of Reverence kind of forces them to overextend into Wrath Effects sometimes, but if I'm bringing in cards like Wrath of God, I don't really want Wall of Reverence. I have the option instead to bring in Infest, uh, but I think that, and well, actually, I might should be bringing these negates too. This this matchup is is not super easy to sideboard for because they have this early element of aggression with things like Tide Hollow Scholar, Knight of Meadow Green, uh, but they also just have a lot of cards that just generate a bunch for one. Uh, Negate probably is worth coming in though, so I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna try to find you, room for that while while you uh, talk about well, your side. Well, you know Nasif brought in Negate, unless you got sure. some in the main. <laughs> no, I um, can't remember everything. They very famously declined to negate a Johnny Goldman in Game Four and won as a result of it. Um, and now I'm thinking if you're bringing out your walls, you probably just got Plume Veils and the two Broodmate tokens as terror targets for me. Maybe I want to trim a terror for this Johnny. I'm yeah. still thinking about this. 
I definitely want to bring out Knights, and I want to bring in Elspeth, another great Planeswalker, and then these two copies of Head Games. What a what a just great card. <laughs> Head Games is one that yeah. I am terrified of. Yeah. If you resolve Head Games, it's pretty Maybe hard to I lose. Maybe I just don't want Wrath of God. Like, I have Volcanic Fallouts already. I have a lot of ways to check. If I if I can check your token generators with counter spells, I don't know if I actually need Wrath of God. And four Fallouts is already kind of a, a lot. I, I'm going to try... I'm gonna try this. Yeah, I'm gonna try bringing in the Ajani and trimming a terror. Okay. I'm gonna I do want to be able to to deal with Plume Veil or like attack with impunity into it, but I, I don't want to draw too many of them. All right, we're here for game two. I'm on the play with a reasonable hand, but my vivid lands are probably gonna have to do some work this game. Uh, I also have a reasonable hand. It's a, a touch slow, but I think that's fine here. All right. Uh, let me this way. Vivid Meadow. Hard away. Uh, generally, you want to take the highest impact card here, so that'll be this one. This deck has very few cards that cost less than three. Yes. Go. <laughs> okay, want to show me the broken ambitions? I do not have... Okay. Well, I make three spirits then. Okay. That's how that works. It's true. That's how that works. And after you saying your vivid lands need to do some work, you know, I just assumed you had a blue card with your red and white vivid lands, but it doesn't matter because no, you, just... you keep you keep giving me arcane sanctum. So. Uh, go. Declare tax. Yep. Seventeen. Huh. So I'm expecting a uh, a cryptic command here. No. And no. I don't know if there's really a good way for me to get out from under it. Um. Hmm. I can't really double spell anytime soon unless I draw something sweet next turn. I don't know what Todd is going to do if I just pass here. I could, like, cryptic bounce my Windbrus Kites, I guess. You just cast whatever spell it is. Yeah, yeah, you I definitely don't... can't end a turn it then. No. If I do nothing here, like, does that effectively play around cryptic? What happens next turn? I could draw some spells that allow me to double spell. Seems reasonable. The fact that Todd's not going to use his mana this turn because if he does, I get to Windbrus Kites mm -hmm. makes me more inclined to just pass. So, yeah, pass. Okay, I'm going to play Plumeville. I am going to play an Elspeth. That's a good one. Uh, I'm also going to tear your Plumeville. Jeez. Okay. I lied. I can definitely double spell. <laughs> <laughs> um... Go. Wonder Sky's pretty good there. I could have played this a lot more conservatively. I'm gonna make an Aaron Barrage. Yep. I'm gonna mush shoot for three. Uh sure. I got a fourteen. Um I will. Hmm. So you're on five mana now. We're looking at Cruel Tomatum in two turns. I have to discard three cards to accrual with them? Sure do. That's a lot. Sure is. <laughs> <laughs> if I cast a spell into the cryptic now, you probably just cryptic, like, counter, maybe even bounce the Elspeth. Or counter draw. Oh, I'm just going to pass. All right. Uh, Fallout, I'll take two and deal two to your Elspeth. Like Twelve. That's pretty good. I could have just main phase that on three to or four or whatever to kill your special procession tokens. I probably should have. So Man. I'm at eighteen and you're at twelve. All right. I really want to gamble here and just draw two with Esper Charm because we're missing a land drop this turn. Um I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go blue blue, white black. I'm gonna draw two cards with a blue floating. I'll tap it like this. Sorry. Sure. I don't use 
Så er vi bud på det. I will main phase of food now. Use food off this. Your turn. Hmm. Unfortunately, I have to keep all the dice on my lands now. Yep. Tell me, Todd. Would you Hi, like to play games. a game? Yeah, I mean, you're just going to take these four, but I'm going to draw into uh, Cruel Tomatoes, so... You can take any number, or you just give me four cards, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. I just got to look through your deck and give you four cards, and that becomes your four new hand. Four lands that all come into play tapped. Dude, I was looking for lands last turn. This don't even hurt. <laughs> I lied, it hurts a lot. <laughs> just give me four vivid lands, probably. Yeah, the question is, which vivid lands? You're definitely getting vivid meadow. All the red and white ones, probably. Yeah, and then I think a blue over black. Just no no black ones. I don't think you have any more red or white ones, though. I think you're just getting a, a bunch of creeks. All right. So by just chain mole drifters and broodmate dragons and esper charms and yeah, cruel tomatoes. You can shuffle that. I make a, to made a token off the Elspeth. Yeah. Um, yeah, you haven't played a land yet, though. Yeah. Play this land. Would you like to cut? Yeah. Right, you're good. Pass the turn. Whoop. I think I'm going to save that. Your turn. You're at 12 right now? Yep. Actually, I should probably play the blue. Johnny Goldman. Yep. Gain two life, or... Activate Muta Vault and put a counter on a bunch of stuff. No, I'll gain two life. All right, so you're at 22. I'm at 20. I took two from the fallout. No, I dealt it to your Elspeth. Oh, yeah, that went to Elspeth. Okay, 22. Mm -hmm. You right. Well, I mean, I'm um, doing it like old Planeswalker redirect rules because that's how they played it. I don't know if that even works anymore because it says each player. Yeah, that probably doesn't work anymore, oh. but we'll play it how they used to play it. That's oh, yeah. fine. How, uh, I'm going to pump this uh, token and attack. Because I have nothing else to yeah, do. I guess. Then I'll play a better <laughs> blossom. Okay. Fast turn. Tilt. All right. Wismayer thing. Drew the Wismayer. Yep. Go. I hate Vivid Land so much. All right. So any Vivid Land that has two on it, or has none on it, is two. And any one that has one on it is one. I used to do it in reverse. Because more often than not, you would just not put that or not use that many counters on it. Spectral procession. Mm hmm. Make some spirits wherever they might be. Okay. Uh, activate Muta Vault. Mm hmm. Minus or Johnny? Johnny. I'll take three damages. Or uh, six plus damages. and attack. Okay, I'll block. Pass. I don't know. He's just going to pump again next turn. I'm basically. Oh, up, this has vigilance. Up the creek. Up the vivid creek without yeah. a paddle. <sighs> okay, well, you're a good one. Okay. Go. I just want to cast Cruel Tomatum ever, man. Just ever. So good. Glorious anchor. Kitchen okay. Finks. Go to 24. 24. Uh, animate the Muta Vault. Minus the Ajani. Mm -hmm. So now this thing is a 4-4, four, four, so even if I pump it with Elspeth... I can double block. Yeah. So I guess I should have made a token and... Yeah, let's say I made a token first, so it'll yeah, get a yeah, counter. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, attack for 4. I kind of feel like I have to take it here. There's a flyers, but most of my creatures fly anyway. Not all of them. All right. Uh, block with the broodmate in case I draw a. 
This is worse if he has terror, but if I draw cruel, I want to get it back. Yeah, and you probably need to play towards the high end. Yeah. Caves pass. So I've already gone through one terror. I can't imagine you have more than one left in your deck. All right, well, we drew another lane, so I quit. Oh, but I was going to head games you again. Give you three different lanes. Ooh, <laughs> got me. <laughs> All right, we're here for game three, and my hand does not look great, honestly. But uh, we could draw out of it, so I think I'm going to keep it, although it is very dangerous. My hand is quite good. It's a very good mix of stuff, and my mana works. So Let's start on a Windburst Kites. Trigger hide away. And let's choose the highest impact card. Seems reasonable. Um, go. Uh, I'm going to make black, white, and play a scholar. I will book an addition to be Clash? Yep. Reveal card and then. Uh, I'm going to put mine on bottom. And what is, you, what you, is winning the Clash do? Uh, mill four, but I believe you get to put it on top or bottom before you mill. I mean, Basically, it, it means you don't get to scribe, but I do. Yeah. Kind of. Kind of wanted that land. Too bad. But I guess it'll go away. Okay. I have no grave. If I had ooh, another land. If I had some sort of graveyard synergies, I would bottom it, hoping to mill into something, but I don't. So and I don't have a way to shuffle my deck. I can't head games myself to shuffle my deck so I draw more lands. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's play Bitter Blossom. Uh, sure. Pass the turn. See if I can finally get an Arilax here. Uh, purge there. Nope. Let's go. I will play a Glorious Anthem. Mm -hmm. I will play another Windbrus Kites. Yeah. Not the fourth land I really wanted, but it's the one we got. Can't be complaining too much. Yep. Uh, this one has a lot of options, and it's unclear which one is exactly the best. Though, if I'm activating Windbrus Wind Kites, it's probably this one. That could be wrong. That's a tough call. All right. Uh, I need to hit land drops. I've already drawn for turn. Uh, yeah. I need to hit land drops. I'm going to main phase this Esper Charm. Draw two. And pass turn. Okay. Well, that's good. I'll be able to... Ooh. Yeah, Planeswalker here would be bad, but we didn't have a, a good answer for it anyway. Now I drew a fifth land so I can resolve ahead games. <sighs> Gurneys. This is just embarrassing. Can I just... Pick five lands and save you some time. As long as they're not, as long as they're all vivid lands. Yeah, that's fine. All, all the, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. Those five arbitrary vivid lands. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you may go. Thanks. I'm not gonna miss a land drop for the rest of the game. <laughs> this card's pretty cut. It's not bad. <laughs> uh, I probably shouldn't use Broken Ambitions on the Skuller. My hand was like Purge Volcanic Fallout, but uh, yeah, like take your Purge and then play Bitter Blossom, and then you kind of have to ask for Charm it. Yeah, go. I think things spiral pretty bad at that point. Um. Which one do I want to cast? Worst case scenario is a... I can't Cruel you unless I drew Untapped Land Cruel. Yeah, I'm just thinking about which one I'd rather get cryptic if I need to get one cryptic. Gotcha. I think I just want to use my mana. Let's go for the goat. Yeah, it works. Get some Kithkins. You can go. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and play Plume Veil. A lot of times you want to save it to ambush, but when I'm at a spot where I basically just need to hit a big spell like every turn, it's, I think it's best to just go ahead and play your stuff. So now there's only one unknown in Todd's hand. Um, I have five mana. I will declare tax. 
um, attack with these before blockers, make white black, flow to white, terror this plume of ill. I don't have Wrath of God on my deck. And I'm at, what am I at? 12? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Is this game where I'm at 12 or am I still at 20? No, you're still 20. I haven't, okay, okay. I haven't attacked you. I was looking at my old life total. I'm sorry. So whatever he plays off the Wimbers Heights is probably bad. So you even got to like choose which one burst dice he's using. It's like I looked at eight cards. Yeah. My deck. Cloud Gate's tough. All I right, call on the goat for a reason. Counter it. The terror? Yeah. Okay. Uh, flash. Yeah, sure. So you mill four? No. It's it's oh, one side of mill, but you get you can put it on top or bottom. Though. Yeah. I don't think I want this terror. I'd rather like drawing broodmate's not gonna get Todd back in this game. Um I'm gonna use the white cast this a Johnny. Okay. I'm going to so you can eat a Kithkin or trade for the cloud goat. I'll trade cloud goat. Okay, you take six, go to fourteen. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna immediately minus this gets these creatures out of fallout range. Yep. Which is the reason I chose to get that one. Head game is so gross, dude. It is quite the card. Okay, that was a good draw. Now I can cast this other glorious anthem. Okay. Um, these are now fours. So if I minus this, is a lethal attack. Mm -hmm. And you have one unknown card in your hand or two? Uh, just one. Bunch of those lands and one card. Of yeah, I'll minus. Okay. Declare tax. Yeah, tap draw. Yeah. You can still hit me with uh, the Muta Vault if he wants, but I just need to hit some hit some stuff. Um, uh, I'd probably tap this real quick. Turn 14. Yeah, I will elect to attack with Mutavolt for four. Yep, uh, ten. Ten. Pass the turn. Yeah, without any Wrath of God in my deck here, I think I'm just dead because he has too much going on. Like Normally the Anthems aren't that big of a deal because I have Esper Charm, Wismare, uh, just a bunch of ways to grind through them. But... Yeah. GG me! I am not Gabriel Nassif. <laughs> and drawing a land on my next turn, I was going to be able to play Glorious Anthem, force Todd to have a Cryptic for these, and then activate both Mutavolts after a Cryptic and still have this be lethal. Mm -hmm. We see these would have been fives. So Todd needed Cryptic plus something else to survive. All right, so the last two days, the champion did not win the match and, in fact, got 3 0'd. Uh, I, I don't know if that says a lot about me as a player or. <laughs> you know, maybe he. <laughs> Ben S and LSV just need to take some less, or not that Retail, Retail and LSV just need some lessons. You know. Where's it? Hold on, your head, <laughs> your head is becoming so enormous. Yeah, the, the, it's going to it's going to block out the sun. It's going to break the <laughs> microphone. Yeah. Uh. No. This like I think the the matchups. I mean, they're in the the finals of the Pro Tour for a reason, right? Like they had to grind through. Like Retail, I'm sure had to beat you know any number of control decks, whether it was blue black or whatever, and. The, the matchup did not feel particularly good yesterday from my side. Uh, you know, perhaps the mana leaks would have changed things. I don't know how much it would have affected because I felt like I got soundly beaten when I was playing Call Blade yeah. yesterday. Today, but... head games straight up won two games where you cast it. Yeah. Uh, I do not personally recall LSV ever casting head games. I could be wrong. If he, if he resolved the head games and lost that game, I would have been very surprised. Because holy crap. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a powerful effect. It, it's so hard to... You, you just have to top deck your way out of it. Mm -hmm. and you, you don't have a ton of really great top decks other than Cruel to make him. Mm. Right? Like, Cryptic buys you time. And... I mean, I have a bunch of draw twos, and like I can yeah. chain those into each other. Like, every time you head game, it's like, okay, it's got to be like Esper Charm, Moldrifter, 
uh, Broodmate Dragon Cruel to me, and I'm like, right now. And if it's not, I'm in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And it, the both games that I was able to resolve had games because you just stumbled once early. And yeah, gave me the I, had to, I had to like use an Esper Charm to draw two so I could hit a land drop. I think that might have happened both times, actually. But, I mean, I think this this is fairly indicative of, of how this matchup plays, where, you know, you apply some pressure, force me to do a thing. Uh, a lot of my lands enter the battlefield tapped, and if I'm unable to keep up, I just give you that window to resolve, uh, like, an Elspeth or an Ajani or... Uh, Cloud Gut Ranger. Cloud Gut Ranger, yeah, just a bunch of these threats that I don't have great answers to. I mean, I, I could have definitely sideboarded the Wrath of Gods. I probably should have. Uh, and it's a I, nice catch-up card. Yeah, and th- I think this is more of me just being a little rusty from these matchups after a decade. Yeah. You know, my bad. My yeah, bad. Yeah, normally against, like, token decks, sweepers are only okay, but if the tokens are coming from, not uh, outside of Spectre Procession, all the tokens are coming from other sources. Right. So you really want to answer the other sources. Yeah, the but you kind of have the... to do both, and that's the problem. And yeah. even, and, and in Game 3, even if I did have Wrath of God at any point, you saw two Mita Vaults and to go along glory with the Santhems three Glory Santhems and, and, and two then, Planeswalkers. Yeah, it was... Um, game 2, I think I could have played different. I could have, uh, like, main phase the Fallout at one point. I could have also played lands differently so I could fall out on 3. Uh, but I want to be able to potentially Esper Charm on 3. Like, uh, the way my land set up, my untapped land was Cascade Bluffs. So if I played that as my third land, Esper Charm, I was going so to be able to Bluffs. Esper Charm until turn five. And there was a chance, I, I was a little light on land, so there was a chance that I just really needed to uh, cast Esper Charm on turn four just to draw some cards. So This is why most decks don't play both Esper Charm and Cascade Bluffs in them. Most decks yeah, do not. So that's... They don't usually go most well together. Most decks do not. You're definitely right. Uh, I think this is also a thing where, um, you know, the... Not having access to Cloud Thresher at this juncture was also uh, notable because I was, I, I mean, it's not like I want Bitter Blossom to stick around anyway, but when you have a bunch of Cloud Threshers in your deck, you don't mind uh, a couple of Bitter Blossoms like sticking around for a little while. Like they can chip in for a little damage, but then at one point you just hit this big swing where you kill them all and then you start attacking for seven. And then you maybe you even like get a fallout in there to clear out the little guys and then all of a sudden, the Black White Token deck's at 7, and it has a chump block this 7-7 seven, seven every turn. Uh, yeah. Things changed. You know, the, this, this format was really aggressive at the time. Uh, that's why you saw, like, the main deck Wall of Reverences. Plumeville was always good. Um, you know, Hallowed Burial made, a, made an impact at some point in the format. I was a huge fan of Fire Spout so, because it was a sweeper that didn't hit your Plumevales, and it could hit Flyers and Ground Pounders, and you could kind of... Uh, uh, you know, deploy it on whichever mode you wanted if, uh, like you say, had some mole drifters in play. Like, they wouldn't get hit, you know, caught up in it. Yeah, no, definitely a, a very versatile card. Saw a lot of play around that time, and the deck just had so many options that you were able to adjust to any metagame shift because you could play any card you wanted. Yeah. Uh, there was also, like, Baneslayer Angel uh, started uh, creeping into the, into the deck at some point. I know that at the Nationals where I played the deck, uh, I chose not to play Bane Slayer Angel, but multiple people did, and it was pretty good. I think I had access to Lightning Bolt at some point. I don't know if the core set just changed everything that year. Like that that's what made all these changes possible. I don't recall exactly. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. This. this is what it was like in that winter, and this was a matchup that definitely was very close back and forth. Uh unfortunately anticlimactic, as you mentioned earlier in game five. And you can see a lot of this. This kind of magic was pretty new at the time, the where the threats were powerful enough that you could play some things early, force your opponent to react, and open a window to land something that could take over a game. Mm-hmm. That wasn't something that happened pre-Planeswalkers, at least didn't happen very often. Right. And th- that kind of magic, this was the, one of the first Pro Tours where you saw that happen in a standard environment. I know like Elspeth Knight Errant was the early... Uh, vote for best planeswalker of all time when it was printed and it was one of the second wave and there was a johnny vengeant was very good for a long time yeah and of course jace came around and ruined everything pretty sure i had a johnny vengeant in my five color deck too now that i think about it and yeah these were these were threats that really did take over games and yeah. I, even a johnny goldman was really good in this deck um in combination with the the purges or the spectral processions and mute vault so that this is one of the first Pro Tours where I think you saw magic as it is played today really come to shape. Mm-hmm. And that, I think that's why it was so interesting. A lot of people, we sort of romanticize magic as it occurred 15 years ago, uh, especially people that started playing around that time because that's when you really fell in love with the game. Magic then, 
I think was a just a worse game than it is now. Did, aside from the gripes about Standard recently, playing Magic where like, playing on the battlefield matters a lot and your positioning matters a lot as opposed to just sitting there and seeing who can fleece the other person on the most two-for-ones is a lot more interesting and I think a lot more fun. I, I mean, I, I agree to an extent. Um, I mean, I, I know, for example, like I, I played a, a common, uncommon cube once where basically every card in the cube was like a Mold Drifter or Esper Charm or a Flame Tongue Kavu or yep. everything was a two for one. And it was one of the most miserable experiences I've ever had. And I think that the fact that those types of cards were uh, hailed as like the best, like Flame Tongue Kavu was the best card in standard for like a year. Yeah. And because there were so few creatures uh, before that, or even since then that presented a, a large body that generated a significant advantage. Now, you know, Rogue Refiner is being banned in standard because it represents a significant body that generates a cart, a piece of card advantage. And and uh, you know, when when something like that comes along, like you have to take notice. And uh, that's just not something we saw a lot. Like when I first started playing, um, you know, Sarah Angel was it. Like that was <laughs> that was the nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here, my, when I started playing, your card advantage came from discarding. Basking wall at a careful study. Yeah, I was. I mean, that, I I started a little before that, but not not a lot. And like that deck blew my mind that <laughs> that was a thing that could exist. Like madness oh, yeah. as a mechanic. You know, careful study. You know, like I was just like, why is this a card? You know, and then my opponent was just like discard two basking root walls, fix you know, fix my hand perfectly, and then it started to click, and like synergy started to develop, and I, you know, my brain started unlocking all these different uh, ways that magic can just be this great game, yeah. and and you know, uh, as over time, like I, I agree that it, it's it's become much more developed in that uh, the games are more complex. And even though the mechanics might be like a little less complex, like the cards themselves, um, you know, all represent something bigger than themselves. And that's not yes. something we had back in 2003 or 2002 yeah. before Affinity. It, it's a result of the way the strategies are balanced. Now everyone talks about creatures or threats being too powerful. Maybe they need to tone back a little. And I think they have to I mean, some extent. Do they not remember Mirror Enforcer? Like that, that <laughs> was a powerful card. Sure. You know, um, <laughs> but... In a general sense. And now, but relative to way, the way Magic was 15, 20 years ago, the threats and answers are pretty even. Whereas before, it was the answers were just way better. And when the threats and answers are even, you have a lot more strategic diversity available to you. You can play these position games. And the, those games are really fun to watch, and they're really fun to play. Mm -hmm. Because you have to think about, okay, you have to think three or four turns in advance. It's, very, it's the closest that Magic gets to chess. Where you're saying, uh, if I play this card and they respond here, and then I can get an advantage because I get this card in before they get theirs. And, and those decisions are really interesting. And it all plays out on the board, so it's more interesting to watch. Uh, I think this this Pro Tour, is, I think, was actually a, a turning point. I think that a lot of people don't like the printing of Planeswalkers. So I think it was one of the best things in the history of Magic that they've ever done. And I this... mean, it gives you a character to root for, A, which I love. I love yeah. the idea of... Like, obviously, you know, before that, there were legendary creatures, and they were uh, heralded as, like, these iconic uh, members of, you know, the the Weatherlight or the bad guys with Yawgmoth and uh, ba even Baron Singer, like the vampires and such. Like, you know, they were iconic cards, and legendary was, was the thing. But, you know, as magic grew, you realize that they're just creatures. They just still died to, to terror, yeah. you know, and that's not fun. Like, when, when you're Gerard Capuchin, the guy who's the hero of the Weatherlight, A, he's not very good. And B, he dies in terror and he costs five mana. Like, that's just boring to me. Yeah, now they're different. And it really, Planeswalkers are these, are these threats that can play defensively, they can play offensively. And Magic is just a much more diverse game as a result of them. And I have enjoyed all five matches we played this weekend. Yeah, me too. This was a lot of fun. I this hope week, not we y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed watching these matches. Uh, if y'all did enjoy them, please let us know in the comments. We will try to do more stuff like this in the future. Unfortunately, we have... Or not unfortunately. Fortunately, we have uh, Return to Return to Return to Return to Ravnica coming out very soon. And that's going to give us some some uh, some new cards to, to proxy up and, and play test some standard with and see if these cards are any good. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some uh, some some standard some new standard for y'all next week. Uh, I think they the preview started last weekend, but I'm not sure. So we might have like 
20, 30 cards to work with. But there's also a big rotation. I think that should be one of our major focuses uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, so be sure to come back and check those out. I'm sure we'll have the normal cast and crew, Brad Nelson, Todd Stevens, myself, and Ross Merriam, bringing you all the action here on the Versus series. For Ross Merriam, I'm Todd Anderson. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.